trust they're feeling encouraged in the presence of the Lord. People have been sensitive to the Spirit. I was getting myself ready in the next room there and praying, and uh, I sent, I don't know, I didn't even ask you yet, did you get my messages? That's funny, because it was exactly the right time. I sent a message to Laura, and I said, uh, I said, if you see this, you might want to listen for the voice of the Spirit soon, because the waters are stirring. And a, a moment later, I heard Wes. So I thought, oh, I, so I typed back, oh, very good, sweetheart, like, good job. <laughs> good listening to me. And uh, then I thought to myself, you know, I don't think she saw that. And she hadn't, but it was exactly the, the same moment. Uh, uh, that usually happens, I, I think, because of the, the way that the Spirit works and the way that the, he organizes the church. I'm not trying to say he asks my permission. That, that's not even close. What I'm saying is I, I because he holds me responsible, <laughs> Uh, I generally can, I generally think, oh, yep, here's something there, something coming. And um, uh, so I'm very pleased with the voice of faith this morning. I'm very pleased with the voice of hope in this house. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and my prayer is that you will internalize that. Some of you needed it deeply, a voice of, of hope and courage this morning. Others of you, uh, perhaps you thought, oh, that sounds just pleasant and kind of just, you know, okay. But you might find that you actually receive something that you need, you will need to give away uh, today or the, in this week uh, via conversation with someone, an interaction with someone. What you just received was an equipping to uh, impart something to someone else. Either way, either way, the voice of hope uh, is, has a, is a tangible thing and has an impact on our lives, and we said Amen, yeah. Amen. Hey, we're doing. We're, we you may or may not know this. It's not. It's not uh, vital to uh, church life uh, right here, right now, in this moment. It won't be life changing for you, but it's fun. You want to hear something fun? Uh, we're fixing to go live. We're fixing to broadcast our services over the over the interwebs. Yeah, over to the interwebs, and so uh, we're going to have an audience of about 10 or 12 people around the world t t tuning in. <laughs> so <laughs> to our friends around the world, what do you want? What do you say? Say it louder. Oh, we're live right now. That's right. That's, that's good. I mean, I can hear you, and, but I don't know what this means. We need to get some, we need to get better. We're, this means crazy where I'm from, and I didn't know if that's what you meant. You're crazy. <laughs> Ro rolling? We're rolling. We're live. All right. Take two. Everybody say hi to our international audience around the world. There are world. You, you have received the international greeting of woo. I often been fascinated by that international expression, no matter what. If it's you're happy, hello, it's always woo. But touchdowns, woo. Any woo. It's woo is the language. I'm not sure where that came from, but you know it's true. Or, woo! I don't know, but woo! <laughs> well, it's fall season, isn't it? Oh, heavens. See, I don't believe that. I was telling someone the other day, you're not a Seahawks fan. I don't know who that's. I've never, 20-something years we've been friends. I've never seen Seahawks. But whatever, it's fine. But it is fall season. <laughs> And it's just about time for people to be huddling in the corners around the church, staring at their cell phones, not talking to each other, whispering, exchanging glares. If that's happening, you know what time it is. Football season. The time of the greatest discord and disunity in the house of God. Yeah. It's all true. Seahawks people glaring at Broncos people, glaring glaring at the only C Dallas Cowboy fans in the room. <laughs> the depth of our commitment to the Cowboys as they have shiny stars. <laughs> and I get to wear clothes with D on them. That's the depth of our commitment. <laughs> and pew, 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 everybody likes Cowboys, don't they, right? But it's fall season at, uh, in, in the United States of America. 
And uh, it's just about a good time for us to stop and have a huddle with Coach Dab. I actually tried to order some really neat coaching outfit, but it didn't come here today. So instead, I'm wearing this new shirt for my wife. So uh, thanks for that camera. Uh, normally, on uh, normally, I'm going to have a hard time not making jokes about the camera. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, for our international audience, well, normally, we have, normally we are text-driven. We approach and stay with a singular text or through a book. But today, we're going to be a bit topic-focused, today and next week. We want to address a couple of things. I want to talk about the game plan at Heritage. Oh, there it is. Everybody say game plan. Game plan. Now, if I, really was, if I was, really was cool today, I'd have a big old whiteboard and a whistle and a hat, and I'd be writing all over the board so you couldn't understand what I say. And uh, that's actually how I teach classes. <laughs> Seriously, there, after a while, my students say, we don't understand what Stephen's on there. I said, right, but I, it was important. <laughs> There's this drawing everywhere. Usually, every word has about two consonants, and then the rest are scribbles. <laughs> but I want to talk about the game plan at Heritage. When, say, when I talk about the game plan, I'm talking about what we do and why we do it here at Heritage Church. A good game, a good game plan requires that we define the win. Leadership textbooks tell us that, but everybody knows that. Big Ed's in the, somewhere around here, and he's going to say amen. That the, a, good claim, a good game plan, first of all, we have to know what a win is. And our win at Heritage is our why. Why Heritage? Why are we doing any of this? The importance of why is known by every toddler. How many have ever been around a toddler? The importance of that question we discover is fundamental to human nature, and it arises about three. They want to know why. That's because there's something in us that wants to know why. It's unsatisfied with just what until we can connect with the why. And uh, I mentioned about a year or so ago that following some life events and some reading and reflecting and some writing and, and, and some, some prayer, I have, I have embraced this singular why for this house. And that is that we would be an ever-increasing expression of Christ in our community. An ever-increasing expression of Christ in our community. Now, these words are not haphazard. They're each one of them is intentional, and, and they have a meaning. Uh, to express means to convey. It means to show, to demonstrate, to reveal or manifest. And what we want to do is demonstrate and show and reveal and manifest Christ. We want to be the expression of Christ. Christ is our life. We want to express the, the new cre that, that, he, that he is the one who makes us a new creation. We want to give expression to the healer. Christ is our deliverer. He is our hope giver. He is our life giver. He is our death conqueror. He is the righteous one. He is the light of the world. He is the enfleshment of love. He is the spirit baptizer. He is the coming king. Christ is our life. For us to live is Christ. We mean to express Christ in an ever-increasing way. Because there's always more. There's more to become. There's more to give. There's more to, to grow. There's more to learn. There's more for us to behold and receive and experience. There's always deeper. There's always wider. There's always sweeter. There's always stronger. More brilliant, more clear, more mature, more effective, more fruit, more joy, more Jesus. There's always more. So our goal is not to have to be some static expression, but a dynamic, moving, ever-increasing, hotter, brighter expression of the Son of God. Amen. We, exp we seek to express Christ in our community, meaning we don't seek to express Him in isolation, not in just theory or on paper, but in practice. We want to be incarnational. That is, a, that is a perfect and loving and powerful God living and moving inside unique and often flawed human personalities, but that's us. We want to be fully present in our lives, in our families, in our communities. We want to be integral. We want to be aware of what's going on. We want to take ownership 
Wherever we are, that's, that's the Bible thing. Remember, remember Joshua? The Lord said, wherever you put your foot, I'm going to give you that. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, we're tyrants and we're going to be landowners. Don't be goofy, okay? That doesn't mean I get to take over, you know, your, your house. But it does mean that as expressions of Christ, wherever we go, we should expect that we bring the prevailing influence of heaven. That's our expectation. Our expectation is not to hide in a corner or wait at the bus stop for the first bus out of here, but that wherever we go, we bring the prevailing influence of heaven. We want to connect and influence. We want to make contact. Salt for salt to do something. It has to be different than what it's touching, but it must touch it. Salt doesn't do anybody any good sitting in a salt shaker. Hanging out with other salt, separated only by the saltine crackers my mom put in there. <laughs> Keep the moisture or something, I think. Right? Salt has to be different. It has to be righteous. It has to be a radical alternative. But for it to do something, it has to touch something. So we want to be an expression of Christ in our community. So why are we here? We are here to be an ever-increasing expression of Christ in our community. You might say, hey, Dab, hey, hey, Dab, yeah, yeah. What about, what about glorifying God? What about evangelism? And remember that guy who wrote that book a few years ago, that Baptist feller? He wrote about evangelism and worship and service and ministry and other stuff. There was five of them. What about just loving God and loving people? Christ is the fullest measure of all of these. You want to glorify God? Be an expression of Christ. You want to live a life of worship? Christ. Evangelism? Christ. Service? Christ. Love for people? Please. Christ. We have no higher measure and no greater goal than Christ himself. Amen. Let us not settle for something less than our namesake. As Paul said of himself, we say of ourselves, for us to live is Christ. What does this mean? To be expressions of Christ means that we individually and as a, a community of believers, that it, we increasingly act like Jesus. We talk like Jesus. We pray like Jesus. We love like Jesus. We do like Jesus. I know that the Holy Spirit is our greatest ally and our only aid. Jesus himself said that we would receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon us and we would be his witnesses, meaning we would be his living evidence. Only by the power of the Holy Spirit will we earn. <laughs> I know we don't like that word a lot because it, we are afraid of being religious, but you know what I mean by earning something. In Acts 11, they earned it. In Acts 11, they started calling those believers christians and they kind of meant it in a pejorative way but they said look at them little christs i'll take it let it be i i i, I, I look at them people acting thinking talking believing something about jesus acting like they think they he's living in them and through them look at those people doing what jesus did look at those people doing what jesus did look at those people acting like jesus i'll take it I, that's why I'm not really happy. You've heard it before. I'm not really happy with that contemporary thing. Well, I'm a Christ follower. That's super. Um, but uh, I don't just follow him. He lives in me. Hey. I, 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 that follow him was only for a smidge. I mean, I follow his ways, and I'm, I'm, he is my Lord. But I don't, I'm not just following him around independently watching him. I, he, he has come to live inside of me, and I'm no longer the same. I, 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 his, I share his same spirit. I'm a Christian. The anointed one. I'm a part of the anointed one. I share in his anointing. Oh, Jesus. His anointing has touched me and changed me. So how else could I live other than to be ex an expression of that same, that self-same spirit? The spirit of the Lord is now upon me because he has anointed me to live and do and be like Jesus. This is our why. At Team Heritage, we want to win. Everybody say, who, who doesn't like to win, right? Don't say woo. You like to win. Who wants to win? Woo. There's your woo again. 
Who wants to win? We want to win. And our why is our win. The more, in other words, the more we express Christ, the more we win. Now, very simple. Each expression of Christ is a win. Everything we do that looks like Jesus, every act that expresses Christ, we say we're winning, we're doing it, and we want to do it increasingly. So what's the game plan? What are we going to do? What will we do? Here's the, it, as simple as possible. People write long and complex essays about this, and I just can't roll like that. I like to just I like to try to reduce things to as to things make things as simple as possible. In heritage, we have a very simple, very simple game plan. It's three words: gather, grow, go. That's it. Say it with me, please. Gather, grow, go. It's our streamlined game plan. We will first of all we gather. Everybody say we gather. We gather to experience the presence of God in worship and in fellowship. We gather to be the habitation of the Spirit. We gather to experience and enjoy the presence of the Lord, to be affected by Him together. For going to... You know, Peter, remember Peter said, such as I have, I give. For us to express, for us to continually or increasingly express something, it really means that we increasingly and continually need to be experiencing something. We, must, we just have to keep breathing in in order to keep breathing out. The, the metaphors abound, but to gather means we are being his temple. Everybody say Temple. Bible describes this, it prescribes this in in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 19 through 22 Paul writes to the church at Ephesus in the introductory remarks there he said, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household having been built on the foundation of of the apostles and prophets Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord see his presence is not a means to an end being a habitation for the presence of God is not a means to an end it really is the end in itself we are being built we are growing together into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the spirit now, privately, because it doesn't make sense to a lot of people, and some people might get a little freaked out, when we talk about we gather, gathering to experience the presence of God in worship and fellowship, in staff meeting, we shorten that word to theophany. But our objective when we gather is theophany. People say, theophany? Yeah, that is, the manifest, that is a manifestation of the very presence of God. And that's, we have no shorter goal than that. We don't, our, 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 gain, our, our, our goal is not to, to, to entertain or to satisfy or to just move people through a number of minutes. See, this gives us focus when we gather. It helps us not to go, oh boy, what about the time? They better stop that song. We better stop, we better not pray. Hey, if that guy's going to pray, make sure he doesn't pray long. I mean, we don't want, we don't want people to make, just make speeches. I mean, we're, not, we're not just trying to, you know, give everybody time just to entertain or, or air their own ideas but we do slow down and recognize that our goal, our priority is not a schedule, but theophany. This is our our ambition, to to experience the very presence of God. We believe that's what we're here for. 1 Peter 2, verse 5, uh, the apostle writes, you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 3, we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. Verse 16, do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? He's speaking in the plural sense there. He's talking about us. The Spirit of God dwells in you. And the Lord, the Lord helping us, this is why this is ever increasing. I mean, I, I could hammer on this for a long time today, but this, this idea 
we're going we're gonna to increasingly own this and it's going to become contagious. And the more we gather together corporately believing that we are not just here to do church or to sing or to do a routine, but we are literally here to share in a lavish experience of the presence of God, then suddenly hope has no boundaries anymore. What is, there is nothing impossible. All joy is possible. People say, if you need anything, I know a place where the living God is meeting with the children of God. We've got, that's what the church is. We're not just here to dish out positive psychology or pedal stuff or entertain people. I don't want to bore you. Our objective is his presence. This is important. I, I have this note from uh, uh, Jack Hayford, and it makes it sound like he emailed me personally. Uh, he didn't. But I have used his bathroom in his house, so we're kind of friends. If he's watching, hi, Jack. How are you? Good to talk to you again. Nice chandelier. I hope you change the carpets eventually. A few years ago. I'm going to talk to Anna. Uh, it was, uh, here's Jack's note. He said it was a mid-September day many years ago. It was a profound moment among the most pointed and poignant moments I have had in my life of God's dealing with my own heart. Feeling desirous of pressing forward into the autumn months with new vision and program, the Lord stopped me in my tracks. Wait. You're rushing forward, and you don't know where you're going. Furthermore, don't ask me for direction as to where the congregation is to be led, because I won't tell you. Your directive is this. Number one, you draw near to me. And number two, you are to call the congregation to draw near to me. Don't concern yourselves with action or activity. Just draw close to me. Then as you walk, as you walk to me, I'll lead you where you're going. You'll arrive in my perfect will because we are moving together side by side. Jack responds to us now. He says, as we enter the glorious fall season, I encourage you not to be distracted by the action and activity going, around you, going on around you and instead to pursue the Lord with fresh fire and renewed passion. He says, let us answer the Lord Jesus' call to draw near to him, laying aside personal convenience and demonstrating our hunger for more of his life, his grace, his character, and us all. He says, let us hunger and thirst after a closer and deeper walk with Jesus Christ, not supposing that we can earn it, but that through seeking him we might learn. Let us study his word, which is full of principles that will teach us to break bonds and release spiritual power in our lives and to engage in prayer power as we intercede for the world around us. We gather to experience the presence of God. We do this, our primary, we have, our game plan includes a primary processes, the things, and those are things that we basically look at, we do every week. Every, the thing we do every week as a church to focus on, to experience the presence of the Lord is this is Sunday morning. We emphasize that our, our main thing that we do that to make sure that we, 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 we facilitate this process is to gather on Sunday mornings. But we also have other things that we do that we, we, if, it's not, if it's not something that happens every week, we call it, we call it a secondary or auxiliary process. That means we gather for prayer meetings, for different times of worship. We gather for, we gather for fellowship. Would you all say fellowship? I have a, there's a colleague of mine in the community. Hope you're not watching. Um, I now have to be more careful what I'm going to say. Um, but again, he might be one of the 13 people watching. But uh, there's a colleague that I have that doesn't like that word fellowship. He's, he insults it. He, he thinks it's silly and religious and all of that. And he likes to say, let's just hang out. Here's my problem with that. It, uh, you can hang out. Man, I almost said something on alliteration that was funny. But anyway, you can hang out at any given bar. You can hang out at any, any pool hall. You can hang out around any Seahawks game. You can hang out anywhere, anytime with anyone. But only people who are sharing a like precious faith, who, who share a consciousness of God's presence, fellowship. See, the, the, the fellowship of believers is distinct. It is sweet. It is different. At least it's supposed to be. It shouldn't smell like and feel like hanging out. Hanging out can lead to dissipation, can lead to all kinds of nonsense. 
but fellowship in, with others in the presence of the Lord should be joyful, should be edifying, it should be fun. There's often food involved, but <laughs> but it's characterized by the presence of God. Are you are you with me? It, it, it can be anywhere, anytime, anything. It can be at a park. It can be downtown. It can be at your a pizza joint. Or, it doesn't matter wh where it is, but it's characterized by the presence of God. I like that word fellowship. Did you notice, though, the verses that we read in talking about being a, a place, a people where we gather to experience his presence? Did you notice how those verses, those, that the metaphors that the apostles use, the metaphors are not static. They're dynamic. They all connote the idea of, of, of something literally growing, being built up. None of them describe an, a, a thing that is fixed, isolated, and unmoving. They use, these, they use the language of being built up and growing, and that really is the, the second part of our plan. We gather, and when we gather, we also do, we do so to grow. We will end up, we have, we have the intention, the design to grow. Everybody say grow. grow. We grow, meaning to grow means to equip believers with, with new ideas and with new attitudes, good attitudes, right attitudes. To displace bad attitudes. We want to equip believers with new behaviors. I think some folks go, new behaviors? What, are you, what is that sounds like you're a, a behavior modificationist. Well, the psychological definition of learning is a, rel a relatively permanent change in behavior. So we, uh, if, you haven't, if we haven't changed the way we live, then, pardon me, sis, you ain't, you ain't learned nothing yet. To grow is not simply to acquire a new idea or new knowledge or to know something more about the word, but rather, as James says, we are not only hearers of the word, we become doers of the word. To grow means that, of course, it means that we seek to increase in size and, and influence. But specifically, grow means grow up. Yeah, grow up. <laughs> grow means that we are being disciples. Gather means that we are being his temple. Grow means that we are being disciples. learning we're learning we're changing we're growing up we refuse to stay the same no matter where we are chronologically in our faith or our body age we refuse to stay the same Amen. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 through 13 Paul continues on this idea in Ephesians he says and he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service for, to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. We're supposed to be growing up and looking like Jesus. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine and every other social media post. <laughs> by the trickery of men. That was synonymous with the aforementioned. By the, by the craftiness in deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love. Ready? We are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. From whom the whole body. I'd have you join hands and weave back and forth here in a minute, but you'd be uncomfortable and want your Purell. Uh, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of of the body you cause the growth we, for us to grow guess what we have to do this together you know what the bible says nobody grows alone you can stay comfortable alone 
The only thing you're going to grow alone is lonely and probably more wrong. We don't grow alone. We grow together with each other and by, with, I mean by one another. I know some folks, you know, you social people, you're full of amens right now. You're like, woo, woo, woo. Hi, social needs. Yay, people. <laughs> then you have folks that might be on the other end of the social spectrum, me and my daughter, who are like, hey, how about we just can grow by ourselves? <laughs> nope. We do require one another. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 10. Listen carefully. This is about growing. This is a longer passage, but let the, let the word of the apostle challenge us here. He says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of, our, of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness, meaning we have what we need, <laughs> through the two, true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust, now, for this very reason also, take a deep breath, listen to this, applying all diligence. You feel the rhythm there? The, there's, a, there's a current, it's in all the scriptures, but it's here again. Peter just has said, grace and peace be multiplied to you. That's grace and peace to you in increasing and ever, ever increasing measure. May you enjoy more and more and more and more and more and more grace and peace and seeing that you have received great and precious magnificent promises by which you have become partakers in the very not divine nature. You've escaped the corruption of the world. You've received everything you need for life and godliness. You get It's like you're walking through the aisles of the store and the Heavenly Father has loaded you down. You got this, and you got this, and you got this, and you got this. And now Peter says, because of all that, now you, you applying all diligence. Now, to whom much is given, how many, just hearing that, you think, oh, we've been given much. Now, applying all diligence, all diligence, be diligent, very completely in this, in your faith, supply moral excellence. Now, I hesitate to make too big a deal about this. Just relax. If, you're, if your Bible says, add to your faith, it's not wrong. It's just that that's the wrong preposition. Just, just don't, don't get upset. It's just that it's not bad. It's just that, that if you read that incorrectly, it sounds like your faith needs something added to it. It doesn't. It means this is in, this, the, the actual, there's a, it's a, it's a, it's a different uh, preposition, and it's in. In your faith, supply. So and make sure your faith includes this. Make sure this is a part of the faith that you have. Your real faith, your faith should include this. In, in moral excellence, moral excellence, knowledge, and knowledge, self-control, your self-control, perseverance, your, uh, to, and in your perseverance, godliness, in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For, listen, for these qual if these qualities are yours and are increasing, say increasing, we're still talking about grow. If these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or is short-sighted, having forgotten the purification from his former sins. If you lack these qualities, you've lost sight of what the Lord has done in your life. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent. You know, grace makes us diligent. It doesn't pacify us. It doesn't make us apathetic, lazy. It doesn't make us loungers. It makes us doers, happily. Because we're not earning, we're learning. Be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. We gather and we grow. Again, the, one of the primary processes that we have in place to facilitate this goal is these our growth groups. And, and they meet every week. Now, they don't meet every week, every week of the year, because life doesn't always work that way, but we try to make them throughout most of the year available. These are, these are groups that you gather in. Hopefully, you'll, we, they're, they're engineered that there's a, you can take your bulletin, and there's some study questions and reflection questions. We encourage you to, to use those if it's a, 
what's it called? It's called the lecture lab is what they kind of call it in some circles. But uh, not that you're being lectured to, but uh, uh, also, but there are other groups that that don't that, that the the content, the subject matter isn't Sunday morning based. It's uh, topical based or or short term based. Get into those. But it's just these are groups where you are encouraged to gather with other people in smaller groups so that you can pray with each other, challenge each other, discuss things, study things, practice things. We also have and increasingly will have things that are not offered every week or as often, including workshops and conferences and classes. We've got things coming up pretty soon. The third thing that we emphasize is go. Gather, grow, and everybody say go. We will go, meaning we will empower believers to speak and to serve and to share. Go means going and saying and praying and giving and teaching and serving. Go means remembering that we are sent ones. Would you all say sent ones? You, where, where you go, we go. Where I go, you go. Where you go, I go. We are sent ones. We are sending one another. We leave this place having been sent uh, by, by, by the local church under the anointing of Christ himself to go be expressions of Christ. We are sent ones. When we operate that way in here together, serving one another and everywhere else. But here's just a few examples of some passages that should stir us. Here's Matthew 10, 7, and 8. As you go, come on, somebody say go. So here we go. As you preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, freely you have received, freely give. Guess what? We still believe that verse is in the Bible. We still believe that. We don't believe that that was limited to a few years of the God's favorite people. We believe he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so is his mission. And so is his compassion. And so is his hatred for suffering. And so is his commission to this church. Go, preach, lay hands, drive out devils, confront suffering. Freely you have received. Give it away. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. If you want to just get your faith stretched a wee bit, the language there, although it allows for it, but the language is closer and doesn't necessarily mean go make disciples inside nations. Go make disciples of them. Capture whole nations under the lordship of Jesus. You say, that's not possible. That would require someone having all authority in heaven and on earth. Oh, someone does. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Acts 1 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, even to the remote parts of the earth. Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportion of faith. If service, in his serving. He who teaches, in his teaching. He who exhorts, in his exhortation. He who gives, with all liberality. He who leads, with diligence. He who sows mercy, with cheerfulness. Whatever, whatever grace is operating in your life, give it away. 1 Peter chapter 4, 10 and 11, each of one of us has received a special gift. Employ it. Employ it. What's that mean? It means your gift doesn't, you might get to be retired, but your gifts don't. Put what the grace he's given you to work. Employ it. Give your grace a job. <laughs> You're writing, some of your graces are standing in the unemployment line. <laughs> Employ it. 
serving one another. Wow. Serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Wow. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Now, you, if you don't think that makes me have a Mufasa moment every time I read it, you're wrong. Man, speak like God's talking. Whoever serves, do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, Paul says, Let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So our going begins here. Our going begins here. You need to practice going, stir up your going, employ your, employing the, you need to give the grace of God in your life a job, so put it to work here. That's why our, our initial of the way that we try to facilitate this, this, this objective is r- r- through uh, creating teams, ministry teams here in the house. Hospitality teams and worship teams and children's ministry teams. I mean, there's lots of teams, intercessory teams. There are teams of people that are gathering together to put the grace of God to work in their lives. But we aren't just called just, just to serve the house. Yes, to particular, and, 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 and we show favoritism, and, 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 and we, 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 we uh, emphasize doing good in the house. But we also, we, we, what God does in the house can't just stay in the house, or it will die in the house. We've got to give it away. We've got to have these streams leave this place. And so we do encourage you, and we talk about it. You are empowered. Go out there and just do it. Just live like Jesus. Also, we, want, we do try to, to organize and do outreaches, and we do mission trips and service projects and special outreach things that we do as a church. We do them intentionally. We don't do them with strings attached as cro- church growth strategies. We do them because we are supposed to gather and grow and go. It's just part of what we're supposed to do. We are supposed to give away this grace that's in our life. And we do so, as Paul says, that Christ may be glorified. Amen. Amen. But we're not done yet. There's, it's like when we say it, there's always more. There's always more that we can do. Not that, not that, that I, I, you, the more that we have to do, but the opportunities are so abundant. We've got, I don't want to call people out, but I'm just so thrilled with our, uh, with our, uh, our, our uh, this is, these, these symbols that Ben just put up. I haven't got there yet, but now that they're there, you can see them. Uh, uh, you should look for these. We try to identify in our paperwork and in our planning that each of our processes, each of our game plan things, has an icon on it so that it helps us focus. But we'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, but in terms of going, uh, we just had just talked with a uh, young gal who's, who's, who's moved across the country and is, and is, and is kind of visiting and, and growing to be a part of this house. But I'm just thinking, you know what? I want to make sure people know that, that if, if you come here, what, what we, we want to come alongside you and we want to partner with you and encourage with you and empower you to do something. And if you've got a passion, I'm not saying that I'm going to pay all the bills for you, but, but, uh, but we will come alongside you and you will have freedom and we will encourage you. And if there's a way that we can facilitate it, we certainly will. But there's a lot more that we can do. There's a lot more pies we can stick our thumb in you know and influence around this city there's a lot more things we can be doing in terms of giving away the grace of god in our lives have i said this out loud yet i I, i've told i know i i've said it but you understand not everything is dependent on on, i'm working on people but we're getting really close to making this happen i've told you that we want to plant a church in cuba right right well it I need you to pray and be thinking and be ready and just be quick because the people I work with, including the Cubans, you understand in Cuba, internet goes up, internet goes down, things happen, they have storms, they have changes in government, and so it's, we, don't have the, we don't have the luxury of, well, let's have an 18-month plan. We don't have that luxury when we work with Cuba. 
Okay, but we, there is a plan, and it is, under, it is kind of under the radar, and we are working. But I'll, I'll tell you this, we are close. It could be November of this year that we plant a church right in Gitmo. Well, Guantanamo, not in the bay, not in the prison. But right in Guantanamo, we'll plant a church. But because we're so enthusiastic and because it's so easy, how many think that in the next year we could actually plant two churches in Cuba? And what they, they've actually said, they've, they've given us, like they've welcomed us, to, I mean, not that we need it to say this, but in both places, they want to say, let's call them both heritage. Yeah, so we'd have an, in, in the south and in the north part of the island, we wanted to plant two churches in Cuba in the next 12 months. On the list, on the list is we want we want to plant a church in Ghana. We can do that. We want to plant a church in the Philippines. We'd also like to plant a church in every zip code in our county. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Gathering, growing, and going—they all work together. They are not independent of each other. And when they are done right, they they happen at the same time. But having these, having this game plan helps us, first of all, just to have a plan. It helps us not to neglect things and not to overemphasize other things. Nobody wants to sit on a two-legged stool. This helps us make sure that, w- that our plan, our game plan, has a full three dimensions to it. So as a staff and as leadership, we think, okay, well, how are we, what are we doing to gather and to grow and to go? And, what, and even when we have an idea, even if, we, you know, if someone says, hey, let's do a thing or let's have a thing, well, we want to ask, we stop and ask the question, why? Not like, why should we do that? But why are we doing it? What's the purpose? Why do we ask those questions? Because it gives us a focus. Helps us to identify our big win. But it gives us a focus so that we're not just running around. I don't know, where is it? Where's Ed? Is he, is he out in the lobby again? Where did he go? I'll say it to you. you. You know just as much. We don't. You can have. You can hold the basketball and run back and forth, but that doesn't win a game. That just makes you busy and tired. If you've been around for a smidge in church, or some of you might go, "Oh, busy and tired." I've done that. We don't want to be just be busy and tired. We want to win. We want to have a focus. We want to be able to look back and measure. We want to give it a hey. This this we are doing this, you know. Our on our primary objective is to gather to experience the presence of the Lord and worship and fellowship. So that that engineers all of our planning, all of our details. And when we look back, when we measure, how many know we should measure? When we look back and measure, we think, how do we do? How do we do? What was what was what did we accomplish? And to me, very candidly, I think about that all the time on Sunday morning. If, all, if I think, you know what, it can't just be about me yammering. It can't just be about a thing. We have to make sure that we organize our service to facilitate the encounter, the experience of God's presence. Amen. 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 So that's, that's uh, the game plan at Team Heritage. We're going to focus on the win, which is being expressions of Christ. We're going to stick to the plan. Everybody say stick to the plan. Amen. We're going to gather, grow, and go. Very simple. No more complicated, no big essays, no weird diagrams. We want to be expressions of Christ, and we'll do that by gathering, growing, and going. So my question to you is, who's in? You ready for, you ready, you ready for a new season? You want to, I think it's time to, for us to have another winning season. Yeah. Amen. Who's in? Anybody in? Let's stand. If you're in, let's stand together. We've got a, just some neat things coming up. The end of this month, we are on our Spirit-filled Living Sunday morning. We have a. Uh, <laughs> okay, thank you. All right. Mm-hmm. I'm getting the translations for Heritage Church in Cuba over my phone here. The end of this month, we have some guests coming in for our Spirit-filled Living Sunday morning and Sunday night. Sunday that those Sundays that we really put the gas on to make sure that we've consecrated time for to experience his presence the guests that we brought in are bringing in are uh, it's really a, just a real treat in that they uh, they they travel around the world and have traveled around the world uh, for decades uh, starting really in the in the middle of the 90s they traveled with uh, Rodney Howard Brown all over the planet in the Philippines and Australia being the primary worship leaders for massive crusades facilitating wonderful experiences in the presence of God. 
uh, and uh, they have just graciously said, yeah, we'll come. We'll spend a Sunday with you just worshiping together and to help lead us into uh, just a greater dimension, a greater height in the presence of the Lord. So that'll be Sunday morning and Sunday night at the end of this month. October, we'll spend a whole month in the book of First Peter. So we've got really good things in front of us, church. But let me remind you, it's not just about planning here and that. We are here to be ever-increasing expressions of Christ. And our game plan is to gather, to keep gathering, to grow, to keep growing, to go, and keep going. Father, in Jesus' name, we as a church, I'm just asking, Lord, if I can say this, Lord, as pastor, I as pastor, as the one who's responsible here, I commit myself to the win. I commit myself that for me and for us to live is Christ. Lord, we will not lessen or lighten our goal. We will not water it down. We will not make our, our great goal to be anything less than Christ himself lit in us and through us. He's our only hope. And Lord, in a practical way, help us just to be simple but diligent in our game plan as a church. Something that we can all participate in. Each one of us. doesn't matter our employment levels. It doesn't matter our age level. Not everybody can do the same thing, but everybody can do something. Hey, now. And every one of us is a living stone being fitted together, being part of the very presence of God. Now, Father, I'm asking boldly and clearly that you help us to draw near to you. We will draw very near. We would walk with you and learn from you, live from you. We commit ourselves, Lord, to drawing near, and we ask for your blessing upon this house, your blessing upon our families, your blessing upon all of our efforts, your blessing upon all that we say and that we do. We consecrate it all to you. We seek and expect your blessing. In the mighty name of Jesus, if you believe that, would you say amen? Amen. 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 All right, friends, I bless you in Jesus' name. Would you do something kind for someone on the way out the door today? Make sure that you right away start putting the grace of God to work in your life. Give it away. Be kind. Do something.